All right, good morning. Welcome back once again. We are continuing on and we are going to be covering chapter 19 today. 19 is the property management chapter. Uh, remember, in Indiana, we have a valid real estate license once you pass the exam. And in Indiana, our license allows us to be a property manager. Some states, that's not necessarily true. Uh, Nevada, for example, has to have an add-on to be a property manager. Uh, you have to have a broker, then go back to school and get this. We can property manage. Now, I will tell you that this is a completely separate skill set because you can broker real estate doesn't mean you necessarily manage real estate property with the same ability. So if you decide to go into that, I would look at some further other courses and there's all kinds of courses out there that can help you become a better property manager, all right? So the first thing I wanna talk about is the three key goals of a property manager. They're on the beginning ch uh, chapter, page 366. The three key goals are this. One is they are to achieve the investor's objectives. Achieve his objectives. The second is to produce income. And the third goal is to preserve the asset from falling into disrepair, all right? So achieve his objectives, generate income, and keep the property from getting in disrepair. So out of the gate, let's start early today. Which one of those three is the number one goal for a property manager? And I'll give you a hint. It's not the one you're gonna guess. Number two, you guys all said generate income. That is not his number one goal. His number one goal, hint, hint, is to preserve the asset to make sure it does not fall into disrepair. There will be times that a property manager schedules a rental unit to not generate income. It's called turnover between tenants. They may repaint, put new carpet in, things of that nature. But he should always make sure that his client's property is not falling into any kind of disrepair. Doesn't let the yard go, doesn't get weed liens from the health and hospital on him, doesn't uh, get condemned. So th that is his number one goal, is to make sure his client's property does not fall into disrepair. Now, in the property management business, there are many, many different assets and facets to it that you can manage. Single family homes, apartment buildings, homeowners associations, uh, trailer parks. I know a guy that owns 6,000 trailer parks throughout the United States. Uh, trusts, all kinds of things property managers can take over. Now, some of the new areas which require further specialization inside of property management, you'll see this thing called a community association manager. This would be like a condo association. You could have homeowners association managers. Properties for seniors, those over 55, they may have a special niche inside of just the property management. Manufactured home areas. Resorts, over at the top of the next page, vacation property homes, a lot of people down in Florida, student rental homes, a lot of people in Bloomington, that's all they manage is student rentals. There's one on page 368 called asset management. Asset management, and let's revisit a chapter that we talked about where the bank takes the property back through a foreclosure and then they're going to sell it as a bank owned home. Technically or typically banks don't do this in house because they don't have the ability. If you remember, I told you the bank's expertise is in the credit worthiness of a client, not managing property. So they actually have what they call asset management manager companies that work for them. 
So when a bank actually lists a home and they call it, people go, oh, it's a bank owned home. It's actually being marketed by a third party company called an asset manager that Chase is hired to do all of Chase's bank owned properties. Chase doesn't really do it in house. So if you ever decide you want to get into selling bank owned homes, you're actually going to seek out asset managers and not really the bank, all right? Because the banks do it. Corporate property managers. Eli Lilly's has apartments all over the city for their visiting dignitaries to come in and uh, at long term, you know, two weeks to a year to work at Lilly. You would also probably throw in this new thing in here now called those Airbnb managers that manage Airbnb properties. You could put those either as resort homes or, or corporate homes, but either way, it's, it's a, a specialty inside of property management. And then the last specialty is called a leasing agent. Now leasing, once again, is another animal. A lot of times you will see a property manager also be the leasing agent in apartment complexes and things like that. But there are specific specialized commercial companies that that's all they do is commercial leases. Uh, First Industrial is a good example. They don't broker conveyance of real estate. All they do is commercial leasing for big, you know, Fortune 500 companies. So a leasing agent typically would get paid outside of when we get into this uh, calculation coming up here. It is a separate entity and typically could get paid separately from management and leasing could be two distinct areas that a person does. Now, once again, there's a whole bunch of list of professional organizations there. No questions ever going to ask you name three professional organizations, so it's not that big a deal. The only one that I would remember if I were you is the first bullet point, BOMA, because BOMA always has a hell of a golf outing, all right? They have an annual golf outing that is tremendous. If you ever get a chance to go to a BOMA golf outing, thumbs up, dude. Uh, They were drinking and eating on every hole. You know, every hole had a nationality. So like the American hole was serving Budweiser's and hot dogs. Uh, Mexico had a, was sponsoring a hole. It had uh, tequila and tacos. And we're talking like at 8 a.m. in the morning. All right. So if you ever get a chance to go to a BOMA golf outing, take that one up. Now, the management agreement. The management agreement is very analogous to the listing agreement that a broker would use to put their seller contract under agency. In the management world, we would have a management agreement that would very similar to the same concept. And as a manager, your property, your role would virtually be very similar to the listing agent and the management agreement would do pretty much the same thing. It would explain your responsibilities. It would explain when you start the contract. It would actually identify the property by the address. All of the same things that your listing agreement would do, except one major difference. In the listing agreement, remember a real estate broker is conveyed special agency. We talked about this special agency, one thing, one area. In a management agreement, they are conveyed general agency, general agency. General agency allows the property manager to do many different things in that one property. They may enter into lawn care agreements. They may collect rent, pay payroll, pay utilities, do the banking. So don't forget those hierarchy. We had the universal, 
general, and then special. And here is the case of the management agreement would convert general agency to the broker so that he could do things like get the lawn mowed, collect the rent, screen tenants, all of those kind of concepts that they would have. All right. Now there on page 370, there they talk about the rental commission and we're gonna do a little bit of math. The rental commission is very similar for a leasing agent that it would be for you when you're brokering and it's the same kind of concept. In that example, they're talking about a rent of 300, 3,200 a month. Remember the commissions are based on an annual basis. So you would take the 3,200 times 12 to get $38,000. And then it's very similar to if you sold a $38,000 house, I love this one. They say 8% commission. That's a hell of a commission. I'd love to collect 8%. So you would take that 38,400 times the 8% and realize that the commission on that for the leasing agent is a little over $3,000. So the math is very similar, except in the listing, we use the sales price in a leasing commission you would use the total lease price all right now in the commercial world it's the total lease price that we're using let's see where we're at that should have went here so in a situation of like this one where they're talking about it being thirty two hundred dollars times 12 is 38,400 bucks. They took it times the commission to get that $3,072, right? Now, here's the key. This is just one year. Let's say, and we're gonna do it this way because it's easy math, they signed a 10 year lease. Then the total value of that lease would be $384,000. Everybody see that? That's the annual total right there, but they signed a 10 year lease. So the value of that lease is 384,000. If you got 8% of the total value of the lease, your commission would be $30,720. It's not a bad commission, is it? So a lot of times you've got to understand it's not the annual, it's the total value of the lease. So watch out for that on tests and test examples and quizzes where they might be signing a three-year lease, a five-year lease, a 20-year lease, anything like that. Because the commission is based on the total amount, not just an annual amount, much like the total sales price for a listing agent, okay?